I'm here with Ian from Ecoustics. Hi, Ian. Hey, Taryn. How are you? Yes, good. So we've done a few of these. And um, we did, well, I think last time we did our best bookies up to about £1,000, maybe $1,200 or yeah. so. And uh, we thought we may as well keep going from there and look at bookshelves from around £1,000 to £3,000. Now, I know prices have changed quite a bit in the UK and there are different prices around the world, but it's kind of a rough guide, I suppose, as to what we're looking at. Yeah, inflation's, so, only, inflation's only made it pay, more, more painful, but... Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, well, interest rate went up recently here by a record level, well, well record in recent times. So, uh, yeah, it's all it's, kicking in. It's the in. same thing. It's the same thing in the U.S. and Canada. I think it's even worse in the U.S., I think. Inflation's yeah. even higher. Oh, yeah, and also the uh, the interest rate's gone up, I think, almost a full two points in the last two months. Wow. Wow, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's creeping up here. Tough times ahead. I don't know about you, but I'm. This is kind of my bread and butter, really. Bookshelf speakers between one and three thousand pounds. That's because we have smaller houses here in the UK. Tend to favour bookshelves and floor standing speakers. I, from a reviewer's perspective, seem to quite enjoy reviewing bookshelves rather than having lots. I do the occasional floor stander, but it's just the space that they take up, the boxes as well as the speakers themselves yeah. so tend to tend to do more bookshelves than floor standards and it's harder for my dog to do damage to bookshelf speakers <laughs> yes yeah so um so i've done a lot of these and um i'm sure you over the years have reviewed pretty much everything far, under the sun. Far, far too many far far too many okay so let's get started um who wants to go first? Do you want to go first? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so this has been the summer of uh, our discontent for me. I've been across the U.S.-Canadian border, I believe, seven times so far, and I have a few more trips. And so I'm going to start with a Canadian product, at oh, number wow. one, PSB. PSB Speakers oh. is part of the Lenbrook Group. Um, PSB is you know part of the large group of companies that includes NAD, Blue Sound, and they also, I know one of, one of these brands is on your list, they also hold the distribution rights for Dolly um, in North America. Oh, wow. So PSB turned 50 this year. And Paul S. Barton, uh, one of the greatest Canadian um, audio engineers of certainly my lifetime, has introduced a series of new speakers called the Synchrony Lineup. There's the T600 and there's the B600. And I was fortunate to be asked to do the actual YouTube global launch, actually, of the B600 bookshelf speakers uh, earlier this year. It was quite an honor for me to, uh, to represent a, a brand from my hometown of Toronto. Um, the Synchrony B600 are, they've already gone up, as you mentioned. They've already gone up a few hundred dollars since launch. I think they've actually gone up $300 since launch and only the first year they've been around. Um, they're now $2,799 US. And I will say, even at that price, they're a steal. Uh, one of the most impressive loudspeakers that I have had a chance to review in probably the last decade, and, and, I, don't, and I don't use that compliment uh, lightly or loosely, uh, Paul Barton has sort of made a name for himself by not introducing cost-no-object speakers under the PSB sort of brand. And they certainly have the resources up in Toronto to create basically any loudspeaker they want. And I've had this conversation with him. Could you make a $100,000 speaker under the PSB name? And he says, absolutely. I have no interest of doing it. And, and he's made it clear, actually, to a lot of the reviewers who know him well, that he'll never do it. It's, it, it's, it's never, it's never going to be in their sort of a product lineup. The Synchrony B600 represents sort of a 50th anniversary gift um, to the high-end audio market. They are, it's a two-way bass reflex speaker. And first of all, it, it is insanely heavy. Um, I remember when I got the first pair way back when um, they were doing the launch and I took them out of the box and I sort of struggled even me. And at that point, I was 43 pounds heavier than I am now, having lost 40, 43 pounds in the last three and a half I'm months. Thinking you lost, I was thinking you lost weight since last time I saw you as well. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I don't know what it, I, I just keep losing. I just, I, I, my doctors have assured me that I'm not dying. <laughs> um, but, but uh, who knows? It's been, it's been a rough summer, but uh, there are it's a very heavy loudspeaker. It's one of those speakers that if you don't grasp it with both hands out of the box, you risk dropping it. And uh, I was very cognizant of that as I took the very very nicely done protective covers off the speakers. That if I didn't stick my fingers in the base port, 
and actually grab the front of the actually the, the baffle is made of aluminum and, it, and it's finished with another material um it's just it's a very very elaborate speaker for paul barton you know it's not the canadian way to do things flashy and uh, I, i'm going to annoy all of my american relatives and as someone who lives in the united states uh, it, it's a it's a very american speaker and it's sort of personality and presentation um for a psb speaker it's not even remotely polite um the, the one inch titanium uh, tweeter is definitely not on the soft laid back side um and the thing that stands out the most about these speakers is that they put out an insane amount of bass and, and, and maybe that's the wrong word for it but my den where when i first tried them is 16 by 13 and I had to pull them four to five feet away from the wall because the bass was overloading the space. He has created a loudspeaker that can play to a ridiculous level. The imaging is first rate. So I'm not a huge imaging guy. I don't lose like my sleep over how well a speaker images. But if you care about imaging, these speakers do unbelievable things with good recordings. And everything is carved very neatly in place um, in the soundstage. Fantastic depth great width the soundstage extended way past the sort of the boundaries of my room i, I think if my room had been 10 15 feet wider uh, I, I i i would have experienced that it's really impressive in that regard and it's just the it's i mean it's it, it you can tell it's a paul barton speaker from the perspective that it's very open it's very clean um it's definitely on the neutral side you know, it, I would not. I mean, some people have said that they find it a little warmer than the typical PSB speaker, and I would say that's probably true. But I would also say that I think a lot of the people have who have reviewed it, including myself, have used warmer sounding amplifiers with it. So I would not recommend very neutral analytical amplifiers with it. I think it'd be too much of a good thing. Um, I know what, what that. Did you, what did you use out of interest? So I've used okay. So on 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 the in terms of amplifiers that I know would not work well with it, I use the NAD three sixteen BE V two. You know, it just doesn't have the grunt. You know, to drive it. And another American reviewer used the Audio Lab with it and raved how it was one of the best combinations he's ever heard. And as you and I are big fans of the Audio Lab, and I happen to own the 6000A as well, I tried that combination. I thought it was as, uh, what's the word, a boring as humanly possible. Like I, I was, I couldn't wait to disconnect the amplifier from the speaker. The Cambridge Audio Edge A was magnificent with with this speaker just it, it has the grip it has the low end control to really really do justice to what these psbs can do and and also the the, the edge a is a little warmer because i think I, I mentioned that just a few minutes ago uh, the the tonal balance kind of work with it i also tried the vincent audio it's a german integrated amplifier um I'm, I'm, my brain's not going to remember the model number but it's not, not one of the top the, the higher end models that they manufacture and it's also a hybrid so it uses tubes in the uh in the line stage that was a very nice combination because that's a two or three hundred watt solid state amplifier class a b into um eight ohms i think it's four or five hundred actually into four ohms so that had no problem driving it so i will say and paul barton agreed with me off camera that these are a loudspeaker that although you could drive them with a lower powered amplifier, they sound completely different with a much more powerful amplifier. And it's just um, the more power you feed them, the more open and sort of dynamic they sound. And it would take a lot of power to blow these babies up. So um, just, just a really, really impressive loudspeaker. Uh, uh, I, if I was going to do like a two channel home theater system, and I didn't want a subwoofer, and I just wanted a pair of stand-mounted, um, full-range bookshelf speakers that could really handle the dynamics of movie soundtracks and 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 also music at the same time. These awesome choice. Great. Well, Paul Barton's a, a guy who I got interested in before I started the channel. I wanted to learn a little bit about speaker design, and um, for those of you viewers who may not know, so. The guy who literally wrote the book on speaker design was Floyd Toole at the NRC. And in the early days of the NRC, talking about probably 1980s, I would have thought. Is that right, uh, Ian? Might even be a little bit earlier, but yeah. Okay. So that's when Paul Barton went and joined him there. And then obviously they went on to Harmon. And um, it's very much that objectivist approach to designing a live speaker. It's about 
producing a speaker that has a relatively flat frequency response, good off axis performance, the directivity index, they call it, and is free from any obvious resonances. So um, I was always curious as to what their speakers would sound like. And um, I think Seven Oaks at one point was selling off the PSB Imagine Minis at a bargain price. And I think their retail price was about six, seven hundred pounds. And I picked up a pair of those, just thought I'd try them out. And I was hugely impressed with those. It's just that's the speaker that still remains in the third system that I have in a bedroom. And um, yeah, so that was my interest with Paul Barton. And I can, I can imagine he's always been very value orientated and Stereophile have put some of his speakers up against much more expensive speakers and they've hit on the A list. They have A, B, C, D. Yeah. And um, they've been very, yeah, they've been impressed. They always punch well above their weight. Yeah. So, PSB so, yeah. PSB has always been about value and sort of performance. And I mean, I mean, they do have a few models that are, I mean, closer to, I believe seven or 8,000. I, th I think in, in the top range that they have, there are mm -hmm. a couple. And also like the, the floor, I have heard the floor standing version of the Synchrony T600 and like way, too, way too much bass for any room in my house. Uh, <laughs> in many ways, I like the B600 a little bit more just because of the fact that the tower actually has so much dynamic range and has so much impact that I feel as if like that unless you're prepared to give it like a really big room and a room that's actually probably got a little bit more treatment than the average, you know, living, living space, I think it's like 6,000 or even $7,000. And I'm sure it competes rather favorably with speakers in the $20,000 range. I wouldn't be surprised given Paul's history. Yeah. He's done, done some fabulous products. over. The and he's years. a very nice man. One of the actually a lot of audio reviewers who grew up in Canada, um, who started in Canada, he has been a great mentor. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually been fortunate to reach out to him over the years, and when I have questions about certain things, he is more than willing to give you an hour or two of his time during his very busy schedule um, to to help you out. You know, and, right. and you can't say that about a lot of <laughs> people in the industry willing to give you two hours of their day. So. Yeah. So shall I go with my first pick? Yes, because I want to hear this one. So my first pick is going to be the Amphion Argon 1, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, Brad. They finish. Hmm. Okay, yeah. so I, I do know the brand, but I've never heard their speakers. So that came about because Hegel products are fairly well known in Europe over the last few years. They've established themselves pretty well. And uh, maybe, again, around five, six years ago, I... Um, went to one of the shows, got chatting to the Hegel UK distributor, who I know quite well now. And he also was distributing this relatively unknown brand called Amphion. And I think it was the Bristol show probably way before COVID, maybe a couple of years before COVID, they had the Hegel, I think it might have even been the H90 at that time. And the Amphion Argon Ones, which was a, at the time, two and a half thousand pounds, it's probably crept up a little bit now. Other rooms were showing, you know, things at 20, 30, 50, 100,000 pounds, and it just sounded really, really good. So when I started the channel, I had a Hegel amplifier. I reached out to Bill and said, send me the speakers. And that was a that was one of the few times I was very surprised. So the Amphion Argon one is, I think it's around a five inch midwoofer with a yeah. Tweeter in a waveguide looks a bit like a Bukart, but they were around a lot longer for 20 years. So before Bukart was up and coming. Do, does well, this speaker, I'm curious, because I, I, I know I've seen this speaker, but I haven't heard it. Is the front baffle, so it has a traditional kind of woofer on the bottom, but is the tweeter sort of, I don't want to say it looks like a horn loaded tweeter, but the. the it's in it, a deep waveguide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just like a Bukart S400, but the Bukart okay. S400 has the drivers inverted. Okay. And um, I guess there's something about that combination that really works, the Hegel and the Amphion. And I just, that it sounded much better that any system at two and a half, three thousand pounds had any right to. All the clarity was there. It's actually a very, for a compact little speaker, it's very dynamic, very clean sounding. And um, Amphion have one foot in the pro audio camp as well. Right, I was going to ask and, you that. Um, that kind of comes through. And I was always a bit concerned with those that they sometimes sound very good, those studio monitors, if you're looking at it from an analytical perspective, right. but they just don't move you when it comes to making music. But that wasn't the case with the Argon One. And um, 
I just just hugely impressive in terms of the marriage between those two products. So then, I after the review, I um, I obviously was very impressed with it. I asked them if I could hang on to it for a while. So I've used it in a number of um, you know reviews. I use it as my benchmark speaker around oh, a thousand okay. pounds, and uh, they kindly loaned it to me. Even it's been on loan since I reviewed it over a year ago. So um, and uh, it's just very consistent you know it's not particularly difficult to drive so you know if there's an amplifier that and it's it's a little bit lean in the mid-range it has a yeah. little bit of emphasis at the lower end and it's very refined on top and it just you know performs very well with any amplifier that you throw it you can put a 500 pound amplifier with them and you know it won't disgrace itself and as you step up to things at 1500 pounds or 2000 pounds you don't feel as if it's the speaker that's the limiting factor so it's only when right. you go above that that you think right okay so that's the see that's a sign of good acoustic engineering the the yeah. the, the, the fact that um it will sound good with a 500 pound amplifier or and show it show off what it can really do at two or three thousand pounds but still the fact that it never embarrasses itself using a, a more affordable amplifier is, is great because it also it also gives um a potential customer something to grow with Be, because like that that's uh, so, sometimes the problem with a lot of high-end speakers that unless you're willing to spend a commensurate amount of money for the amplifier and the source you're never really going to hear what maybe that product can do and so if you're, if you're just starting out but you really love the sound of that speaker and that's sort of like you know the maximum that you know that you can afford to spend you know it, it, so that so the amphion actually sounds like a very smart speaker for people who were starting out yeah i just don't think that it's, it's i think it was about 1200 pounds it's now 1300 pounds okay I think. Which, so, which is which is not unreasonable i mean yeah. it's, it's that actually sounds like a actually relatively fair price yeah and it's just the clarity and the dynamics and the amount of bass that you get out of a relatively small box it's not going to give you that ls35a wonderful mid-range tonality okay. and nuance so that you have to step up to something a bit more expensive but that you're looking at speakers then at around you know two and a half three thousand pounds. I haven't found anything else that beats it. Actually, sounds like a speaker that I actually want to listen to. I just have to find it in the U.S. or Canada. Yeah. Um, actually, you mentioning the LS35 is a good segue into my second choice. So uh, I have been a uh, spender customer for 14 years, and so I, I, I am a big spender fan. I don't want to use the word fanatic because I own nine different brands of speakers, but um, there's something about a Spendor. And you know, I, I owned a pair of Spendor Classic uh, SB23s for 10 years. And if it, if it, a bunch of clumsy movers in New York City had not dropped them, I, I, would, I would probably still use them as my daily driver. The Classic Series is definitely unique for Spendor. And you what's, know, what's your what's your pick between them? What's the oh, exact model? Pick? Oh, I, I picked the classic four or five, which is the baby. And and the okay. reason why I picked it is because first of all, it's the only one that fit in our price range, which is a little depressing. Because because one of the things that's happened actually with Spender, Spender has so Spender now has three lines. They have the A line, they have the classic line, and they have the D line. And I like the A line, but I I think it does some things that are a little not Spender in their character. And I find that the classic speaker, the Spender Classic line, is really to me like what got me into Spender to begin with, and I've never really deviated from that. The Classic Four Five is a two-way, you know, bookshelf speaker. It's sealed, so unlike some of the other speakers on our list, it's actually a sealed cabinet, which gives you a little more room to play with if you do actually have to put these into a bookshelf because there's no base really coming out of the back of the cabinet. The Classic Four or Five is. 20 i want to say it's 2700 as well in the us i think inflation has also forced the sound organization who are the distributor to raise that price um the S spender makes a custom stand now for all of their classic line but the price is ridiculous uh i i think actually in the us they charge almost a thousand us for a pair of stands for this particular speaker and and, and that to me is a hard pass um, I have to say, if anyone is considering the Spender 3.1, Classic 3.1 or the Classic 4.5, there are plenty of other affordable metal stands from a bunch of... There are a number of British brands. I mean, Atacama in the UK. Yeah. Gig Harbor Audio is a hi-fi store in Washington State 
and I bought a pair of 24 inch stands from them years ago. Beautifully made iron stands. They're filled with sand. It's what I use actually under the Synchrony B600. Um, I paid like $300 for them. But, but the spenders really do sound better on proper stands. Just don't spend $1,000. I mean, that, that's, the, that, that, that's like, like foolish. Um, Are they like an open frame stand? Is that what they do with those? Yeah. And, and, and I've seen them for so much less. But, but I guess, you know, Spender had someone cast or cast a new set. And it has the Spender, you know, badge on them, which really I don't want to see. I mean, when I, when, I, when I buy a stand, I just want to see, in fact, I don't want to see any brand name. I just want to see either the drivers or the, or the grill. Um, there, um, it's a real wood veneer, so it's, it's not vinyl. Um, some of the other speakers on the list you use vinyl. Um, you know, always buy Spender in, in Walnut. Over the years, I, lear I learned the hard way. Don't buy the cherry. Um, why, why is that? It just, well, the way that they fade, I, one thing I've noticed, especially with wood speakers with real wood veneers, is that depending on where you live, I happen to live near the ocean and my house faces east towards the beach and I get a ton of sunlight. And when I, even when I lived in apartments and, and I had similar scenarios and I had like the drapes open during the day, I noticed over time that the, the finish would change, which makes it very hard to resell when the back of the speaker is like two shades lighter than the front. Especially if there's one closer to the window than the other. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, the exactly. Yeah. yeah, I learned that too. Um, but it just, it's a sealed speaker. It uses a one inch dome tweeter, a six inch, uh, actually, I think it's even a slightly larger than six inch, it might be six and a half inch uh, woofer. One of the big changes at Spender over the last decade has been they have moved away from the very soft polypropylene drivers. Uh, Spencer Hughes and the original design uh, designs used. Um, so all the drivers now are a much stiffer material. Um, the, the, the tweeters are also not. I, don't, I mean, I don't even. I don't even think they are soft dome. But if they are, they're they're not the the original designs in terms of like that. That gave sort of Spender a bit of its softer sound. Um, they they started with the. They started with a contract from the BBC, did they? Are they yes. a spin off yeah, from yeah. the BBC, LS358? Yeah. yeah. Kind of, all that Be stuff. Because, because Spender stands for Spencer and Dorothy Hughes. Right. Uh, that's it's a combination of the two names. And the the four five is just a really, really nice speaker. I, I mean, if you've never heard of Spender, the, the, I mean, there's a thing like what is a typical British sounding bookshelf speaker? In my mind, Spendor, Proac, and Harbeth are it. But I, but like you, I happen to prefer the Proac and Spender side of the sort of ledger. Um, it's a very, this is a very modern sounding Spender. So if, if you're used to hearing older Spenders that sounded a little wooly and kind of lumpy in the bass, even though this is a small speaker, um, it's tight, it's defined. I mean, it doesn't, it won't play very low. I mean, I think the speaker rolls off in the upper 50s. I think it's a 55 hertz. I think that's like is, you know, we're really where the bass starts to disappear on the speaker. So if you have a, if you have a good subwoofer like an SVS or a REL, it's a perfect speaker for that. Um, not the easiest speaker to drive. One of the things I loved about the SB23 is that it was a true 89 to 90 dB eight ohms speaker. And it was a big chunky, two-way bookshelf speaker that was front ported. I could use eight watts of a 300B amplifier with it, and I did for many years. Marvelous. I could listen to Led Zeppelin and Rush and uh, ACDC, and I could listen to Dead Can Dance, and I could listen to Talking Heads at very loud volume, and it never, ever really started to compress or sort of crap out. So in that regard, it was very easy to drive. The Classic 4.5 is not that way. The classic four five is actually, if you're lucky, 82 or 83 dB. Um, it only drops down to about six ohms. I think it's an eight ohm speaker, but I don't think it ever really drops below six ohms. But if you're lucky, it's in that 81, 82, 83 dB range in terms of its sensitivity. 50 watts minimum. I, I've heard it with lesser, um, I guess, lower powered amplifiers, actually like the Cambridge that you talked about on your recent video. It's Sounds good, but it needs that kind of you know control to just sort of yeah. really really show what it can do, and the the mid range is so clean and has so much resolution and it's such a pleasant. It's a very balanced speaker. We use that word a lot in reviews. You know, does the speaker sound balanced? This is a very balanced sounding speaker. It's never boring. Um, there are there are some older Spender models that I can understand why people think they sound boring. This is not one of them, um, yeah. and it's just it's just it's just a good speaker.
Like it's it's it, it very it very much flies under the radar because you know there's so much media attention on the A line and the D line, and mm -hmm. people look at the Spender Classic series and think they're kind of old and fuddy duddy looking, and you know they, they, they're not sexy. Like, well, like, well, they're classic. The name's called Classic for a, a reason. A reason. Even they've got modern drivers. It's right. Very much that retro design, which is coming back all the rage by. By the oh. count of things now, so. yeah, vintage vintage speakers are vintage looking speakers are definitely all the rage.